This morning we're talking about uh, in the beginning part 11, which is uh, intelligent design. Um, a little bit about the book for those who haven't been here before. Its uh, full title is In the Beginning, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. It's uh, written by Brian, or edited by Brian Ball, who also wrote uh, a good share of it, about uh, two chapters, if I remember correctly. Um, he was born in England, got his MA from Andrews, his PhD from the University of London, and then became a pastor evangelist, a conference president in England, and then moved down under to uh, Avondale College, and uh, is currently president of the South Pacific Division. He's married to Don, and they have tr three children. It was written from the perspective that views scripture as decisive. As the uh, uh, introduction says, its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins. And because of that, the bulk of the book is about theology, uh, things like the evidence for the faithful transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, and a view consonant with Jesus in the New Testament, and also very close study of what the text means itself uh, by Richard Davidson. It does include scientific chapters, and this is the first one we'll be considering, the one by Tim Standish. Uh, among others, uh, Ariel Roth has written the chapter on the flood. And um, it also deals with theistic evolution and evolutionary morality. This particular chapter is written by Dr. Standish, he, who got his BS from Andrews University in zoology, he got his MS at Andrews University in biology, and then got a PhD from George Mason University, which I understand is actually the University of Virginia, uh, or at least affiliated with it, um, in biology and public policy. It so sounds like environmental issues. <coughs> He taught at Andrews University and also at Union College, and I'm not sure what the dates are on that. I couldn't find them out uh, easily um, without emailing him, and I didn't have time to do that. Uh, but he's currently a researcher at the Geoscience Research Institute, and I believe he uh, edits the newsletter, among other things, and uh, also the comments that go into um, the uh, journal Origins. And he's married to Karen, and I have, I think, two children. One child at least, I know, but I'm not sure. <coughs> Pardon me? Did I, have, did I have that wrong? They have one girl, and uh, um, maybe she goes by her middle name or something, I'm not sure. Um, Intelligent design is a relatively recent phrase describing a concept that first appeared openly in the origins debate in the 1980s. It recognizes the strength of the evidence for design in the natural world and underlines the serious weaknesses inherent in evolutionary theory. Much of the evidence underpinning intelligent design has only become clear as scientific knowledge has grown in recent dec decades. Um, this is his introduction. It is also true that some of the basic concepts have been articulated since at least the 1960s, notably Michael Polanyi's arguments that, quote, machines are irreducible to physics and chemistry, end quote, and that, quote, mechanical structures of living things appear to be likewise irreducible, so in vaguely like irreducible complexity. And uh, Michael Denton's influential book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, published in 1985. Almost from the beginning, IDEA has been the target of sustained attacks from those committed to neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory, a fact in itself that should perhaps alert us to the strength of the intelligent design arguments and the challenge they create for neo-Darwinism. A good working definition of ID is that it holds Quote, it is possible to infer from an empirical evidence that certain features of the universe and of living things are best explained by intelligent cause, not by an undirected process such as natural selection, end quote. 
In this chapter, we discuss briefly the current debate over ID, emphasize two of the most compelling arguments in favor of intelligent design from molecular biology, irreducible complexity, and specified complexity, and draw attention to the weaknesses in the main arguments brought against them by some contemporary neo-Darwinists. We also point out that ID per se is not precisely the same as biblical creationism, although clearly related to it, and suggest in conclusion an appropriate Christian response. And that's a pretty good outline of what the, argu uh, the article is about. First, he asked, is design detectable? Intelligent design asks a very simple question. Is it possible to detect intelligent design if the designer is unknown? The answer is equally simple, yes. Now, uh, notice it doesn't say, is it always possible? And that's a mistake sometimes people will make. Well, this must be a perfect test, and it has no false negatives and no false positives. Well, it probably has no false positives if it's applied correctly, but it certainly does have false negatives. Doubts only seem to arise when the question is asked of nature. Is it possible to detect intelligent design in hieroglyphics? Yes. Is it possible to detect intelligent design in flint arrowheads? Yes. Is it possible to detect intelligent design in radio signals from space? Participants in the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence program certainly hope so. Is it possible to detect intelligent design in DNA encoded I information within cells in the elegantly complex molecular machines it codes for? Uh, surprisingly, the answer is yes. Recently, Wired Magazine confirmed that it is possible by reporting the deciphering of hidden messages encoded in a synthetic genome created by the Venter Institute, or Institute uh, with the old Latin V instead of U, as it was spelled out using DNA codons. By the way, that's just simply because there is no U in, in abbreviations of uh, amino acids. So they had to use a different letter. In almost any possible place where intelligent design might be detected, its detection causes little controversy except when it comes to nature. If design is detected in nature, it seems only logical to ask who is the designer. Some people are very uncomfortable with what the answer may be unless the designer is already known and is not God. As Craig Venter and other scientists at the Venter Institute are definitely not gods, the discovery that they had engineered a message into an organism's genome was relatively uncontroversial. If someone discovered a message in human DNA that said, uh, created by the Lord God Almighty, reactions would probably have been dramatically different. The question intelligent design asks does not suggest that a message like this is likely or unlikely to be discovered. In fact, it does not directly address the question of God's existence at all, because it is not equipped to do so. And yet, ID remains controversial. Those committed to a materialistic philosophy believe that the scientific study of intelligent design is unacceptable, because it frequently denies the materialistic neo-Darwinian explanation of the origin of the universe and life on Earth or more precisely, the development of life on Earth. Creationists who believe the Bible do not operate within the constraint of those who, believe, who choose materialism as their belief system. A reasonable reading of the Bible suggests that design is evident in nature, for example, Romans 1.20, but also recognizes that chance and natural laws operate in the universe and that these may explain much of what occurs. The philosopher and mathematician William Dembski has formalized a conceptual filter for di differentiating products of intelligence from those that are accompanied by laws or chance or some combination of the two. Dembski's filter is ex illustrated in figure one, and we're going to see that in a minute. The hallmarks of intelligent design that Dembski recognizes are a combination of specification, specification and complexity. Unfortunately, when you read the book, the illustrations are all in the back. And uh, uh, I, from what I can gather, uh, uh, 
many, uh, at least uh, a fair number of, of publishing houses really don't do very well with uh, figures, um, even though this is relatively simple. And uh, I can remember when I wrote my book, I actually wound up having to do all the figures myself because they didn't, they had never done figures before. That was La Sierra University Press, which is now folded. Um, and basically what you do is you start with a phenomenon you're trying to explain, and if it's, there's a high probability that it would happen anyway, you attribute that to law. If there's an intermediate probability, um, but chance is a reasonable explanation, and you attribute it to chance. If there's a low probability, but the event is specified, then you attribute it to design. If it's not specified, you attribute it to chance. As some wag has said, uh, the, uh, the uh, materialist uh, one tends to say um, everything else is just fine except if this is true, then you go start over again and try until you find one of the other two answers. Uh, yes, do you have the microphone there? I'm not clear on specified. What, what is that referring to exactly? Well, what that means is, let's, uh, let's suppose you take it in, the, in, a, in a, a, a series of numbers, okay? Um, and you have, you have a string of numbers and you're looking at it. Uh, they could be produced by some kind of random process. Uh, if you get, you know, 2, 5, 6, 1, 8, 9, 0, 0, 2, 3, something like that, you're looking at it and you're thinking, well, that's probably just, you know, random numbers that are, pulling it, uh, that are being pulled out. On the other hand, if you get a string of numbers that looks like 3.14159263, all of a sudden uh, that's not probably random because it happens to be the exact specifications for pi. And the chances of somebody just pulling those out as random numbers is vanishingly small. Well, not, maybe not vanishingly small, but certainly very, very small. And if you kept on going and you kept on running into those same numbers, uh, the, or those same kind of numbers, then the probability would be very high that, that uh, there was some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, choosing going on. Now, if you... Uh, if, of course, that was the re end result of a measurement and it happened to do with the length of, uh, of a, uh, uh, a something measuring a circle, uh, you could probably then attribute it to law. The problem you would get is after you got about uh, 200 digits into the numbering system, that's way beyond what any measurement is going to be accurate to. And so law won't explain it either. At this point, you're looking at somebody who knows pure mathematics and is giving it to you. So, yes. So this is a predefined configuration that you just run into in nature and you say, oh. What they would say is not necessarily predefined in the sense that um, um, that it's that it's predefined by us, but it's more like it's 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 independently specified. Um, I'll give you another example. If you go out to Mount Rushmore and you look out at the hills there, you will see what looks like four human faces out there in the granite. We were just there two months ago. Yes. Um, Crazy horse is much more impressive. It's amazing what erosion will do, isn't it? <laughs> um, especially if the erosion is the type of, uh, that's done by uh, five to six foot creatures who are hitting uh, uh, things on granite when they have a purpose. 
You know, that's, those are the kinds of things that uh, uh, they're complex, you know, quite irregular. It's not smooth like a, a, a ball. But on the other hand, they're specified because they look like four U.S. presidents. And that's what they're talking about is complex. It's not, it's not a simple shape because balls can happen just simply from, uh, you know, tumbling or something like that. But they're specified in that you look at them and they, uh, they look very, very close to something that you know about. Uh, down to the fact that they have noses and ears and things like that. And uh, uh, yes. Is it specified because it's needed? Like say that you need a 1032 screw by one quarter to hold on a plate. It's there. Okay, it's there. So it was designed. So as opposed to chance. It's, it's something specified that's needed. Um, well, it, certainly you can have stuff that is functionally specified, and if that requires enough complexity, then uh, it would probably pass the test, at least as far as uh, Dembski is concerned. Uh, you'll have a lot of people arguing over that, because if they were to admit that, in fact, Dembski is correct on that, um, suddenly it is obvious that, for example, proteins are complex and specified. The amino acid sequence is just uh, is the right amount to give you a something that will, for example, break up a certain sugar um, into two smaller sugars or something like that. And if you have something that will do that, uh, the probability of getting it by chance is very, very low. Depending on the size of the molecule, it might be in the order of 10 to the 100th power. That's even allowing for the fact that some parts of it don't have to be as specified, like some of the chains that are outside could have maybe three or four or even uh, 20 different amino acids and it would still work. But because on the inside, you're limited to maybe two or three at the most. And if you make too many of them uh, wrong, even if, uh, even, in other words, you could get one that's incorrect, but it's say five are incorrect, it will no longer fold in the right uh, way. And then finally, there are some parts that, for example, in the very heart of the, uh, of the uh, enzyme site, where only one amino acid will work. You change that one, and it's completely not working. So when you add all those probabilities up, uh, you know, you're still looking at 10 to the minus 75 that you're going to get it by random uh, uh, error. The, and big, the uh, biggest thing I can relate to is trying to put something together with the wrong screws. Yeah. <laughs> um, and... It, and the fact of the matter is that's relatively uncontroversial. As uh, Tim Standish is pointing out, in everyday life we use this all the time. You know, if somebody walks into a bank and puts out a 20-digit number in order to get into a safe, you think that they knew what that number was. They didn't just sit there twiddling the dials and get lucky. Okay, I don't know how they knew it. Did they know what the combination was to begin with? Did somebody tell them the combination? Uh, did they figure out that you were using a mathematical formula for the combination? Uh, did they listen intently while they were turning the knobs so that they could hear things click in? And they knew that way that what the combination was. But somehow they knew that wasn't just turning the dials because the probabilities are just too low. That's totally uncontroversial. The controversy comes when you start asking questions like that about biological stuff, because that implies that somebody fixed it up somehow. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't know how. 
uh, and that someone, number one, uh, destroys all the arguments for, uh, uh, for descent from randomness. In other words, they, it destroys the arguments for uh, 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 Darwinian evolution, random variations in natural selection. And number two, the skill that it takes to make a protein is still beyond us and our computers, which means that it's not only an intelligence, it's somebody smarter than us. And that gets dangerously close towards pointing towards some kind of supernatural intelligence. Yes? Yeah, I, I can see where uh, specified uh, ends up into low probability. I'm wondering if there isn't a little bit of redundancy between those two words there and that what he's really talking about is just simply low probability. Well, he's not just talking about low probability because, for example, if I dump a bunch of sand onto a counter, the probability of every single grain fitting that exact specification, if we were to go through a number of the grains and pull them back out again and dump them on, this, on, the, on the counter again, the probability of those grains in that, arriving in that same uh, pattern is extremely low. It's, but there's nothing to distinguish one particular pile of sand from the other pile of sand. On the other hand, there's a huge difference between, let's say, a protein and a random string of, uh, of uh, amino acids. Yes? I don't know how to give an ideal definition, but perhaps it's uh, specified as a previously existing something that's meaningful or functional, best illustrated by example. For instance, compare a random set of letters versus the phrase, God loves you. Even a short phrase like, God loves you, is highly improbable just starting out by chance. And uh, if, if you go to, for example, this paragraph that's right here, you can be pretty well assured that I didn't just turn on the computer and it appeared. I spent some time typing it in. Uh, you wouldn't know whether I spent time typing it in, whether my wife or my kid or somebody else spent time typing it in, mm -hmm. uh, whether I was able to scan it into a program that uh, recognized uh, fonts. But what you do know is that that's just not uh, somebody pecking around at random because you're not going to get meaning out of it. And the longer the paragraph is, the more secure that conclusion is. Complexity is related to probability. The more complex something is, the less probable it is. Most people are familiar with probability and complexity, but specification seems more subtle. And he gives an example. The cylinders and pistons in an internal combustion engine are an example of specification. The metal from which these engine parts are formed may be molded into almost any, that's my error, conceivable shape. But in reality, they fit together in such a way that engines work. And by the way, that's a good illustration of how uh, uh, errors in design do not necessarily mean that there's no design. Uh, um, there is no natural law that causes iron to form cylinders or pistons or dictates that they should fit to a tolerance of several micrometers. They fit together because they were designed to do so by intelligent engineers with the intention of making a workable engine. In real life, Dembski's criteria for the identification of the phenomena that involved a, an intelligent a cause may not work perfectly. An interesting example of this occurred in a widely reported incident in 2005 or early 2006 when a fake rock was apparently used by British intelligence agents to conceal a spy communication device in Moscow. Intelligent agents uh, commonly attempt to mimic the product of chance and laws for their own reasons. Um, uh, another one is one if by land and two if by sea, and that was definitely a matter of intelligent design, but it was virtually undetectable, which is, of course, why it was used. Because if you didn't know what the code is, you would have no clue that a uh, message was being sent. Uh, sometimes they may be successful on first inspection, but this is not as easy as it may seem. 
For example, when asked to mentally generate a sequence of heads and tails instead of flipping a coin to do so, the attempted random sequence can generally be differentiated from a genuinely random sequence. Another problem is that unguided nature using only chance and natural law may occasionally produce shapes that, with a little imagination, resemble designed objects. In Hamlet, Shakespeare noted this phenomenon in the following dialogue between Hamlet and Polonius. Hamlet, do you see yonder cloud that's almost in the shape of a camel? Polonius, by the mass, and is like a camel indeed. Hamlet, methinks it is like a weasel. It is backed like a weasel, or like a whale. Very like a whale. And in the interest of time, we're going to skip over the uh, uh, end of a paragraph there. He talks about Catalina in Indian Rock. And then he says, on the other hand, monumental carvings of stylized human heads on Easter Island are clearly a product of intelligent design. And here's an example of shapes recognized as human faces, very little specification. Um, and uh, this is the, uh, the uh, Indian rock, and there's an uh, enlargement of it. To, you know, if you try real hard, you can kind of make a, a face out of it. You can make an eye and a nose and a mouth. Maybe you can do down here. Um, but it's not anywhere near the specification of Mount Rushmore, for example. Differentiating between outcomes of chance and natural law and products of intelligent design ultimately hinges on questions of how complex and how specified the objects are. A human face is a complex shape, but different faces vary significantly in morphology, and the general pattern we recognize as a human face has relatively loose specifications. And I think he dropped the parenthesis, or somebody dropped a parenthesis in front of figure two. Because of this, we recognize faces in everything from smiley faces to a few strokes of a cartoonist pen, eroded rocks, and an apparently random sequence of typed symbols. And of course, there's the ultimate uh, irony where everybody recognizes that nowadays. <laughs> Loose specifications greatly increase the probability of pattern matching. However, it would be remarkable to confuse eroded rocks for the Venus de Milo or the Venus de Milo for an eroded rock. When two objects are events meshed to very tight tolerances, as in the example of an en engine, cylinder, and piston, such specificity strongly suggests intention and design. Irreducible complexity and specification. In his groundbreaking book, Darwin's Black Box, Michael Behe laid out a special case of specified complexity called irreducible complexity. B defined uh, complexity as a single system composing, composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function, wherein removal of any one of the parts causes the system to eff effectively cease functioning. Irreducibly complex systems are commonly in complex machines like air uh, common in complex machines like aircraft, cars, and computers. Take the pistons away from a regular internal combustion engine, and while something that could serve as a large paperweight may remain, it will not perform the function of an engine. The same is true of the cylinders, crankshaft, or several other parts were removed. The right combination of purposefully created parts makes the whole, comple a, a, the whole a complex functioning unit. Of course, it is not necessary for every part to be vital, to the function for a system to be irreducibly complex. In an engine, it may be possible to remove the valve cover and still have an engine that functions, at least for a little while. The cells that make up living things abound with irreducibly complex molecular machines and systems. An example that appears to be universal to life is the protein molecular machine called ATP synthase. This machine, that's my typo, har harnesses energy inside cells figure three, and can be thought of as a turbine-coupled generator. The turbine is called the F0 subunit, while the ATP chemical energy of the cell is generated in the F1 head. These two parts are coupled by a gamma protein drive shaft. Without, that drive sh without the drive shaft, the entire complex mechanism is essentially a useless device that does nothing at best, and that at worst may cause problems. 
It is also worth noting that the ATP synthase machine does not operate in isolation. It is only one component in a far larger system. And there's figure three. And you can see the, the turbine and you can see the, this is the F1 generator, this is the, uh, and there's the protein drive shaft, the gamma that he talked about. And you also need A, B2, and D. If you don't have those, it, does, it also doesn't work. So there's, more, there's several parts there that if you were to take them out, the machine wouldn't work. The complexity of molecular machines like ATP synthase is self-evident. Proteins that make up complex molecular machines like ATP synthase must fit within specifications that make the tolerances necessary in macroscopic machines appear trivial. Another example of specified complexity is found in the order of nucleotide letters in DNA. The star is a note that he's, an explanatory note. Symbols must occur in very spe specific order to be able to code information. For example, the sequence GOD, D, uh, GDO, ODG, OGD, G, DGO, and DOG. Only two arrangements of the letters, G, O, and D, have meaning in English, and those two, GOD and DOG, have completely different and unrelated meanings. The ordering of nucleotide letters in DNA works in essentially the same way. If DNA is to have meaning, random arrangements of nucleotides will not work. The nucleotides must be arranged in very specific sequences to code for functional proteins, like those from which ATP synthase is composed. Without laboring the point, encoded information like that found in DNA is clearly an example of specified complexity. The question is whether such specified complexity is reasonably an outcome of chance and or natural laws or the product of an intelligent cause. Generally, information is encoded in some physical medium that obeys natural laws in the same way other physical materials do. For example, there's nothing magical about paper and ink in a book or reflective spots in polycarbonate that make up a DVD. Like all other media, these media perform according to regular physical laws. The same is true of DNA. It is a physical medium that carries information encoded in a remarkably efficient way, but the chemistry is not the information. Like all information, it is independent of the medium that encodes it. Chance and natural law may reasonably play a role when it comes to the media in which information is encoded, but they are not reasonably seen as sources of the information itself. Opposition to intelligent design. On the surface, idea appears to be straightforward and logical, almost a statement of the obvious. However, it does not lack an enthusiastic opposition that presents confident-sounding refutations of its arguments. For example, it has been pointed out that biological IC molecular machines appear to meet Charles Darwin's acknowledgment that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Kenneth Miller co commented on this proposition by saying that while, intelligent, while irreducible complexity may preclude direct evolution of molecular machines and systems that e exhibit design and complexity, it does not preclude indirect routes. Miller and others invoke co-option of proteins from other molecular machines. Perhaps the best potential example of this process is the bacterial type 3 secretory system. On closer examination, however, they, that is such counterexamples, are less than compelling. The number of proteins in bacterial flagella is far greater than those in the TTSS. Uh, in fact, the TTSS appears to have evolved, or as he put it in a note, devolved, from the significantly more complex flagellum. Infinity, miracles, and natural selection. Another counterargument to intelligent design has been championed by Richard Dawkins. On the one hand, Dawkins claims that, quote, biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose, end quote. But on the other hand, that natural selection, the blind unconscious automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know as the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life, 
that's a editorial comment, of course, has no purpose in mind. Dawkins skillfully executes a number of logical sleights of hand to support his thesis. Without a specified goal or purpose, natural selection can only work on already functional things that must rely on either chance or intelligent design to produce them in the first place. Ironically, Dawkins is famous for using a portion of the quotation from Hamlet cited earlier to illustrate how natural selection can create information rapidly. Um, he talks about a computer program that created the word, me thinks it is like a weasel, all in capitals, but hey, it's good enough. The program evidently had the target phrase programmed into it, and unfortunately, the actual program cannot be checked. Richard Dawkins never left the program itself, which is an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon in a, in a scientific uh, setting. In fact, Dawkins himself pointed out the problem. In each generation of selective breeding, the mutant progeny phrases were judged according to the criterion of resemblance to a distant ideal target. The phrase, me thinks it is like a weasel. Life isn't like that. Evolution has no long-term goal. Or as somebody else said, and he has a long quote before that, directed evolution is a self-contradictory nonsense term that has no place in science. Um, keep that in mind when people are talking about evolution. They have in mind something that has no direction this uh, theistic evolution is uh, considering that God directed an undirected process is kind of an oxymoron. Uh, yes, uh, you have the mic there. Is that a quotation from somebody? The directed evolution is a self-contradictory? Yes, that is. Who? Um, I'd have to look it up. Dawkins. It's not Dawkins. Um, Uh, David Abel of the Gene Emergence Project and the Origin of Life Science Foundation. <coughs> Again, this is a Reader's Digest version because we don't have time for the whole thing. When not repeating the same kind of reasoning as in Climbing Mount Improbable, Dawkins uses smoke and mirrors to make it appear that chance is capable of getting things started. Given infinite time or infinite opportunities, anything is possible. The large numbers proverbially funny, furnished by astronomy and the large time spans characteristic of geology combine to turn topsy-turvy our everyday estimates of what is expected and what is miraculous. Well, maybe partly, but not completely. Weaknesses in the argument from infinity. Uh, there are four major problems with Dawkins' confident but nebulous assertion based on infinite time and infinite opportunities. The first is that the premise about infinite time is not true. For something to happen, even in infinite time, it must have a finite probability of occurring. In short, it must be possible. For example, given a six-sided die and an infinite number of throws, throwing a million sixes in a row is inevitable. In fact, this would be expected in an infinite number of times given infinite attempts. But even with an infinite number of throws, a seven will never come up. A second problem is Dawkins' conflation of a long period of time with an infinite number of opportunities. These are not the same thing at all, and the time spans invoked by neo-Darwinists do not provide the probabilistic resources required to explain <laughs> the origin and evolution of life. Not only is the age of the universe trivial compared to infinite time, but infinite time does not necessarily equate with infinite opportunities. Imagine a motionless cube of pure hydrogen at zero degrees Kelvin. In an infinite amount of time, with no energy input, nothing will happen. It certainly will not turn into a kangaroo or even a simple bacterium. In reality, even Darwinists do not invoke infinite times or an infinite universe. That's done by the people who argue about multiverses. It is multiple universes, not infinite universes, that are invoked. The difference between infinite possibilities and just a lot of possibilities is a third major objection to Dawkins' contention. 
Even if his premise about what is possible given infinite time or opportunities was true, the reality is that the only major group claiming infinite resources are creationists who believe that God is infinite. The creation itself gives every appearance of being finite in every measurable way, including time, space, and mass. A final major objection to Dawkins' contention is that it makes science irrelevant. In other words, if it were to succeed, if we were to show that there was really infinite universes, if the multiverse theory was true on the grandest scale possible. True science is concerned with observing regularities in nature. We call these regularities natural laws. Resorting to unobservable multiverses, infinite or even lots of time that our inability to time travel prevents us from checking on, or spontaneous generation of light that is not observed today or reco recorded in history, is speculation, not science. If we add infinite time, anything was possible in infinite time or opportunities, then the predictive power of science would become irrelevant. Why object to a creator god? Why doesn't this paper turn into a hundred dollar bill? If anything is possible, science becomes irrelevant and explains nothing. One may as well be unsurprised to see pigs fly. In fact, the very term specified complexity can be traced back to the eminent Darwinist and origin of life researcher Leslie Orgel, who wrote, living organisms are distinguished by their specified complexity. Crystals fail to qualify as living because they lack complexity. Same thing over and over and over again. Mixture of random polymers, which don't have the same thing over and over again, but they fail to qualify because they lack specificity. And then we're going to go beyond molecular data because molecular biology deals with life at its most fundamental level, one where we believe we have some understanding of the chemistry involved. It is proven to be a field on which those arguing for design like to challenge the opposition. But design is evident in many other levels in nature. Indeed, irreducible complexity illustrates the interdependent essential, interdependence essential to life from the molecular level all the way up through the biosphere. And he gives the example of the nitrogen cycle. Being liberated to see design in nature does not restrict us to see nature only as a vast machine or even as many small machines. If nature was designed by an intelligent being, design is a creative work, act, a work of art. The early Christian philosopher Athenagoras of Athens put it this way. If therefore the world is an instrument in time, in tune, and moving in well-measured time, I adore the being who gave it its harmony and strikes its notes and sings the accordant strain and not the instrument. We do not approach and do homage to the powers, but their maker and lord. Design in the natural world not only points to the existence of a designer, but also hints at his nature and the possibility of a relationship between the creator and his creatures. Then he takes up the subject of evil design. All views that allow for design in nature may not necessarily appreciate its beauty in the way Christians are encouraged to. Because of the evil that appears to be engineered into nature, some might see the idea of design in nature as repulsive or terrifying. All life operates by grinding beautiful organisms through the inevitable process of aging and death. Design like the viper's system of envenomation or the bombardier beetle's toxic rocket system appear to have the sole purpose of causing mis uh, misery and death. And yet they appear just as designed as the elegant systems by which plants entice insects and place their pollen on them for transfer between flowers. The problem is that arguing against design on the basis of evil in nature is not logical. Just because the flint arrowheads Kalashnikov assault rifles and hydrogen bombs are all designed to maim and kill does not mean that they were not designed. It is the purpose of the design we find repulsive. Concern arises not with the design but with the possible intent of the designer. Christian theology recognizes the problem of evil and proposes an answer. The goodness and love of God, demonstrated in the life of the Creator Himself, Jesus Christ, 
counteracts the misery, suffering, and death that are the consequences of evil freely chosen by humans. Paul contends that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs, looking to the future and the deliverance to come. That which was originally beautiful and free from evil will be restored. Christ came to save his fallen creation. If then, the case is so clear for ID, why is there such opposition to it? Reading the minds of ID opponents is impossible, at least for me, but one possible reason has to do with what ID does to Darwinism and its associated religious beliefs. Darwin is the material, that's, I think that should be Darwinism, and I, I may have mistyped that, is the materialistic belief that only chance and natural laws account for all of reality. It specifically includes the possibility of any supernatural involvement or intervention in life and human existence. The sin ID commits is twofold. First, it allows the possibility of outside intervention in nature, a door that Darwinism closes for philosophical reasons while providing a scientific-sounding justification. Second, ID opens the door to refutations of the adequacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism of random DNA mutation coupled with natural selection as an explanation for life as we see it. Dawkins has written, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Because ID depends alone on empirical knowledge and logic, it uses the tools of science while peeling away the scientific cover enjoyed by the underlying and opposing philosophy. In other words, ID renders atheism intellectually unfulfilling. Nature acting alone to produce life in all its shimmering diversity is an example compelling, compelled by atheistic philosophy, not necessarily by an open-minded study of nature. On the other hand, appreciating design in nature does not automatically lead to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or to a literal six-day creation within the last few thousand years. This is neither surprising nor disturbing, although it has caused some Bible-believing Christians to claim that ID does not go far enough. This view arises from an unfair expectation of what nature studied using the tools of science can tell us about the God who gave us both nature and revelation. Noting again Romans 1.20, Paul affirms, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature, those are the things, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without e excuse. Clearly, nature studied objectively can get us to square one by helping us to realize that there is a creator. That is what ID does. The formerly atheistic philosopher Anthony Flew, who changed his mind on the basis of ID, put it this way. The discovery of phenomena like the laws of nature has led scientists and philosophers and others to accept existence of an infinitely intelligent mind. Some claim to have made contact with this mind. I have not, yet. But who knows what could happen next? Someday I might hear a voice that says, can you hear me now? It is highly unlikely that creation alone can tell us the whole story of sin, human sin and re divine redemption. We do not have all the data and our minds are imperfect. And neither nature nor science can replace the gospel message to suggest that they can, should, or might is misguided. A Christian response. If ID is sufficiently credible from a scientific perspective but does not scientifically prove scripture true, um, tell the gospel story, or in identify the designer as a Judeo-Christian God, what is an appropriate response? One productive response is illustrated by the biblical story of Moses and the burning bush as recorded in Exodus 3. As the story unfolds, Moses asked God for his name. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I t say to them? God's response, recorded in verse 14, is essentially what I.D. tells us. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. To his people enslaved in Egypt, God said, don't worry for the moment about who or exactly or what exactly I am. The important thing is that I am. 
It was only when Moses acted upon the truth that God exists that God revealed himself as the leader and deliverer of his people. People in the modern world, including God's people, need first to understand that the creator God exists, that he is, before they can take the next step, understanding who he is as revealed in scripture. Ideas a plow, preparing old, hard intellectual ground for planting. But Christians are called to do more than simply plow the fields, that is, argue the case for ID. They are called to plow the fields and scatter. If Christians leave the fields having only plowed and not sown, weeds will grow up and the fields will be useless. To ensure that there will be a harvest and that it will be great, it is the Christian's task to enthusiastically sow the seeds and check the weeds. We have argued that ideas enough to start the process of opening minds to the creator and savior of the world. But Christians must dutifully shoulder their part of the load if the evidence for ideas to result in souls won to God's kingdom. Christians may choose to sit on their hands complaining that ID does not go far enough, thus ensuring that it does not. Alternatively, they may play their part in the divine plan by providing a logical and coherent biblical and Christ-centered follow-up to the revelation, revelation in nature that God is. Now, I like this chapter. Uh, the, it fits into the book very nicely. There are the chapters on theology, transmission of the text, and so forth. Um, there's this chapter on intelligent design. There'll be one on cosmology, the limits of evolution, critiques of evolutionary theory, and the flood by Ariel Roth. And then uh, two chapters, one on evolutionary ethics and one on theistic evolution. And that's kind of where this fits. Uh, the last time I noted to, in the last chapter, my reaction to it, the opposition of naturalism and supernaturalism is well outlined by the last chapter. And this, by the way, is why intelligent design is so important. And now you can see the intelligent design that actually fits uh, into the previous chapter. Now, Dr. Standish does a very good job, especially for the space, in destroying the foundation for the naturalistic criterion, uh, critique of creation theory. And I just wish more theologians realized the strength of Dr. Standish's arguments, and I don't think they would be as afraid of science as many of them are. But that's my take. Now it's time for yours. Comments, questions? Uh, I should probably note that it is now 11.30. We did have a little discussion in the middle of this, so we didn't completely <laughs> take all the discussion time. Uh, but uh, <coughs> uh, those of you who need to be elsewhere uh, should probably keep that in mind. Um, Ariel? Well, no, nobody else has anything to say. I'll just raise the question. Uh, he doesn't get into the issue of first cause, which, uh, you know, you can turn to a certain extent, you know, people say, well, where did God come from? And you can turn right around and say, where did the universe come from? And you're facing that uh, blank uh, issue of, you know, how come there's anything instead of nothing? And uh, <clears throat> The fact that there is something, you know, does tend to suggest, hey, there's something beyond here now. I, uh, I have to go beyond normal cause and effect to answer that question in a very unsatisfactory way. Uh, so I'm not sure that uh, it's a real strong argument, but it's, uh, I think, part of the issue. Well, basically, uh that gets into the question of, uh, is the turtles all the way down? Um, and, the, and of course the question is down to where, and after a while the turtles uh, uh, have to weigh quite a bit, and uh, one wonders how the lower turtle manages to support the upper turtle. But um, uh, you either have to have causes that go like that all the way down, or else you have to have one pre-existent cause that's always been there. 
Uh, for a long time, the universe itself was held to be that kind of a cause. Uh, the interesting thing is that that theory has, for practical purposes, completely collapsed in terms of physics. Virtually everybody acknowledges now that the universe itself has a finite age. That age is in the, in the order of, uh, and now, now thought to be somewhere in the order of 13.7 billion years. Um, is people have argued for 8 billion, people have argued for 20 billion, but nobody is arguing for 100 billion, let alone infinite age. Um, and so that means that you don't have infinite time, which gets back to one of the comments. And the only way you can get infinite time or, or infinite opportunities is to start having multiverses. And besides that, the universe, at least the universe that's observable to us, has a finite dimension. Uh, it's, the amount, it's as far as light can travel in 13.7 billion years. And in fact, it's a little less than that because of uh, uh, various other constraints. And what that means is that uh, the universe is limited not only in time, but in space. And therefore, you, two things happen. One of them is you can't have the universe go on back forever, which means you can't have life going on back forever, and uh, it's just always been there. You can't turn life into a god, if you want to put it that way, and you can't make the universe have godlike properties. The universe had a beginning. And that means if there's anything that is eternal, it's got to be, if you want to put it that way, supernatural. That makes a lot of people uncomfortable, and uh, the uh, present position of physics did not come without a number of people fighting very hard against it for that precise reason. You know, one of the things I thought was very good when he was pointing this out is that the truth of the matter is that this is pointing out the obvious. And people resist it vigorously, not because the arguments aren't there. It's because they don't like the implications. The consequences. Yes. I just wanted to <laughs> play or make a statement about if <laughs> might be kind of funny, but if the universe has not always existed, this was my this has been my reasoning since I was young, really young. Um, if it hasn't always existed, then where was God? Because God has always existed. That's something, of course, we cannot fathom. So it's kind of a rhetorical question. But there had to have been something. I, God was not, was God in a vacuum or, you know? Uh, that raises a very interesting philosophical question. It goes at least as far back as Augustine, um, where at one point he sort of jokingly said that, um, that uh, God was preparing hell for people who asked such questions. That's what he was doing. Uh oh. <laughs> 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 but, but, uh, but the truth of the matter is he made a much more uh, philosophically defensible comment, and that was that, um, that time itself began at a certain point, and so asking before doesn't make any sense. Now, the remarkable thing is that if you talk to physicists today, they will tell you that precise thing. Same thing. That at, at the beginning of the universe, not only did matter begin, I mean, the whole concept of matter, not just a particular particles. Um, and not only did space begin, that then in fact the universe was, uh, when it started out, was uh, basically a point. But at the same time, time began, because time and space are, uh, Inter yeah, partially interchangeable. Yeah. And so what that means is that there was, in fact, a beginning to time. And that to ask what happened before is to ask a question that has no physical meaning. Um, may I? You see, this is where we come face to face w uh, 
we're confronted by the limitations of our own intuition and our own language. We do not have a language to describe this instance. Notice how Brother Paul was trying to say, at the same time, time began. Boy, this is, this is a conundrum, isn't it? We don't have the right words to express this. That's probably because we don't have the right concepts to express well, we it. We don't it, have the, It's yes. beyond our ex human experience. It is, it, this is, you know, it's, uh, how do I, uh, by, by virtue of analogy here, let, let's, let's just look at this. Our brain has uh, a trillion or so neurons, give or take. Which of those neurons has the foggiest what an idea is? Can the neuron even think in those terms? Can the neuron think? I mean, do you, do you see what I'm saying? And yet, thoughts exist. They transcend the capabilities of the neuron. Similarly, there are realities that transcend our capabilities of relating to intuitively. You know, this point about language is a fascinating point in that uh, uh, you, you get into some cultures and they will have five or six different words for sheep. All meanings have, you know, slightly different connotations so that they're not just multiplying words for sheep. They're agrarian societies and they deal with sheep all the time and it's important to make distinctions <coughs> among sheep that the rest of us don't. Like Eskimos with snow. Yeah, yeah. like Eskimos with snow. And the rest of us, it's snow, it's snow. Well, uh, we start to get there when we talk about powder and, and hard packed. Uh, but, you know, their, their appreciation for snow is so much more than ours because they deal with it all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and so, <coughs> but when we're dealing with something like the universe that we have never actually experienced, in fact, it is probably if not mathematically, at least physically impossible for us to experience this, um, when it goes beyond our ability to explain, we search for words to try to convey some <coughs> inkling of our thoughts. And even our thoughts are, are you know, you'd have to say through a glass darkly, as the Apostle mm -hmm. Paul would put it. In my normal cause and effect uh, comfortable uh, realm, I have a great deal of difficulty thinking, for instance, of a God who's infinite, you know, who always existed, uh, and so on. I get a little bit of relief uh, in terms of uh, relativity, space-time warps, where my uh, concepts of time have to kind of break down uh, and so on, but uh, I, I think probably uh, to me the solution is uh, our thinking is way too simple for the reality we face and uh, we need to uh, be humble uh, as we consider these various things. Uh, Amen. Yes. God's thoughts, uh, well, he tells us again and again, are above what we can think. More, uh, more, more deep, more full, can carry more concepts. Uh, we, we don't, even I think when we get to heaven, we're not going to get the full impact. Because I'm not sure it's possible for us to do so higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. Education. Now it sounds like we're going to need help with that one. Yes. One of the questions that came to my mind about intelligent design is the question why do young earth creationists kind of put intelligent design at a arm's length? They want to embrace it for some reasons. Other reasons, they want to keep it uh, 
a little bit distinct from young earth creationism. And I think it's the whole issue on the age of the earth, age of the universe, do we accept radiometric dating? Intelligent design, as you know, and Timothy didn't point it out, though. Uh, it does not take a position on age of the earth, age of the universe. Now, let me give you a scenario or two to think about, and it's kind of what I've come to. Whether it's 6,000 or 6 billion years for the history of, of our planet, you still have to have a starting point. We've been talking about the starting point of the whole universe from a cosmological viewpoint you still have to have divine intervention. And I think Tim has done an excellent job, as you pointed out, of showing that infinity does not solve any problems. Infinite opportunities, infinite time, whatever, however you want to use infinity, it doesn't, cannot account for design. Uh, I think the difference between young earth and old earth creationism then is the amount of interventions you might have in the history. And I like uh, what Dr. Brand has said for years, that a, a good term for creationism is interventionism. In other words, in a spectacular, unique way, God has intervened at the appropriate time and imposed, I think that's a good word to use, imposed design into a disorderly, or dysfunctional arena, or it's going that direction because everything is going downhill. And so God intervenes. Um, old earth creationism probably has about as much interventions, but they spread them out for a long, long time. Young earth creationism has a lot of interventionism. For example, the flood is just one big one. So I, I would like to um, explore this further. These are just my preliminary thoughts. I, I think that you know that's probably a, uh, that'll keep us going for at least an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a it's a good observation. I think it, I, I think that's one of the reasons why um, uh, some young Earth creationists uh, creationists tend to be leery of of. Uh, of uh, accepting intelligent design, I my sense is that most of them are quite happy with the arguments, and they're quite willing to use them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is one of the frustrating things from the other side, is that they feel like the intelligent design people are just repackaging old right. creationist arguments. Right. Well, in a sense, they are. But in another sense, hey, they're good arguments, mm -hmm. and you haven't answered them. Not really answered them, not convincingly answered them. Uh, they're only, they're, it's only convincing to people who already know that the answer has to lie in certain areas and therefore uh, you do the best you can and that must be the answer because there's no better ones. Mm -hmm. But if you call into question that whole paradigm, then the answer I think is staring you in the face. And that, that I think is really what's going on here is that the, the power of the paradigm is not allowing these people to look beyond certain ways of doing things. And, but the, the thing of it is, once the paradigm is broken, then you have to start asking a whole bunch of other questions. Um, like, how, how do you trust the scientific community when they've already blown it on intelligent design? They're probably reliable everywhere that it isn't theologically important and that there isn't financial gain to be had. But you put those two in and suddenly you really need to see the evidence for yourself. And that's the thing that I would encourage people to do, not only what, what most intelligent design people do is they spend their time endlessly arguing the point that this is obviously design. Whereas what you need to do is you need to stop and say, okay, look, what happens if you accept that argument? And the fact of the matter is you come very rapidly to supernatural design somewhere along the line. 
you open the way towards having a God. You open the way towards the possibility, at least, of the Bible being a reliable guide. And finally, you discredit the standard scientific community's response because what's been done to intelligent design is not uh, what should have been done. It should have been studied and, in my view, accepted. The, the evidence, for example, for the intelligence at the beginning of life is so overwhelming as to be, um, they don't argue about that. They try to change the subject to something that, that they can actually answer because they know it's a losing argument. I'd like to give one illustration of, of this debate, old earth design versus young earth. Um, after the Arkansas trial, which was, was that in the 1980s, Ariel? Yeah. Um, Geological Society of America had an annual meeting in which they, for the first time that I know of, they addressed creationism in a symposium. I don't know which year that was. Maybe you remember. I've forgotten. It was probably the late 80s. I had the privilege of attending that GSA meeting because I wanted to hear what they were saying about creationism. I think it was in the perhaps mid-80s. And so they had opportunity for questions, but you had to write them out. So I wrote out a question. I said, well, you're talking about creationists. They're all different kinds of creationists. I said, what if you have a creationist who uh, accepts this 4.5 billion years for age of the Earth and 600 million, back then it was about 600 million, for life on Earth, and um, pretty much accepts the history that goes after that, what do you do with those people? And the convener, very interestingly, said, we don't have a problem with that because they're one of us. Now, that has changed. That has changed somewhat with intelligent design. Now they want to say they're not one of us. So it's very interesting how the political winds blow even in uh, geological studies. You know, that would make an excellent thing to, do, to explore. I'd like to, maybe as a librarian, I could document uh, some of that. Why don't you uh, see what you yeah. can do to, to yeah. bring up something, that, that, that change in attitude. Yeah, I because think there's Because I think that it is a very significant one. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that the, uh, the answers might be very revealing as, mm -hmm. to, as to what's really going on. So I was there. I was the one that asked that question. So I clearly remember what I had asked, and I clearly remember the answer. Yeah. Now, but I so could probably know, get a recording. They're not that. happy with you, Ross, at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, weird. Yeah. Let me throw a little bit of a complication into this, kind of a practical illustration of what we've been talking about and design and, and stuff, and that is um, design sometimes isn't as easy to detect as we think it is, and sometimes it's much easier to detect than we think it is. Both can ha occur at the same time, and a lot of it has to do with uh, our prejudices about uh, what we think should be designed and what we think should not be designed. Well, let me give you an example. About two months ago, I was uh, working and I was drilling on a project just over the hill here in Moreno Valley, well, actually between Moreno Valley and Riverside, where they had done some grading about five years ago. There was about 2,000 lots back in the, in the cul-de-sac back in there where they graded and then the economy went bust and they sat on the, the land for you know, the last five years, haven't done anything with it. So they said, well, let's go take a look at this, see what we can do with it, and see if we can start you know, putting houses on it again. So we went back in there to determine, you know, okay, what grading was done, where, where were fills put in, and where were natural materials still in place. So there was one boring I was drilling where I knew ahead of time, supposedly, what the depth of the fill was supposed to be. It was supposed to be about 80 feet. I was told this by the other geologist who was in charge of the project. 
So I was down at 80 feet, looked like Phil to me. Kept going a little bit more, I got to 90 feet. Still kind of looked like Phil to me. Kind of starting to wonder, well, it was supposed to be only 80 feet, 90 feet. This is starting to get a little weird. I'm supposed to be at 80 feet. So I kept drilling. Got to 95 feet, still looked like Phil. Didn't look like the natural material. So this isn't good. It was the end of the day, had to quit. So I called the geologist who had told me it was at 80 feet. What's, what's wrong here? I'm at 95. I'm still not seeing it. He said, mm, that's not right. Let me look. So he looked at the map again. He said, uh, no, actually, it was supposed to be at 40 feet. Whoa, wait a minute. I, I didn't see that. So I put that aside. We stopped that hole. We went on and drilled some other holes. And I came back to the laboratory, took the samples apart. Could not hardly tell the difference at all. I, I looked and looked at the samples, and then finally, you know, just barely detectable, slight variations and difference. Okay, yeah, maybe I did miss it. There, that it really was at 40 feet. That was actually correct. But because I was thinking, I already knew the answer, it made sense that it was this answer. I didn't even think to see that it was, I was wrong. I missed it, you know. And then, Another hole, uh, you know, a couple lots over, the difference in the material was completely obvious. You can easily tell the difference between the fill and the, the natural materials. You move over the other place, completely almost impossible to detect. So there's both paradigms can occur in, in you know, just a very short change. And it's all dependent on <laughs> what you already think the answer is. Uh, I think that's really important to your, your expectations and, and especially your deeply held philosophical expectations can blind you to evidence that is in fact there. And uh, uh, even the practical e expectations that you have uh, can, can make you think something that, that uh, is not actually true. Um, and of course, people on both sides of the, say, uh, of the field will say, well, see, they've got it wrong. Um, but I think that intelligent design is good enough that, in fact, it will withstand that kind of scrutiny. It will withstand as strong scrutiny as you want to do it, as long as you don't make the probability of design being correct infinitely low. Once you do that, of course, you've completely ruled it out. And then no matter what kind of evidence you have, you won't see it. Yeah, and that's basically what they, they always want to say is, is that there's a chance of design is so low and then we take this low chance and still call it a natural process because we just want it to be by chance, no matter how small that chance is. Yes. Well, next week we'll uh, talk about the universe uh, and cosmology, and uh, I, I think it will be interesting. And uh, we're still looking forward to the Grand Canyon, and uh, so come on back when you have the chance, and we'll uh, we'll try to make it uh, interesting for you.